Good evening, everyone. I know everybody's sort of getting settled. Um, we want to welcome you to the SCAP Student Health Event. Thank you all for coming out tonight on such a cold night to learn more about the 2018 Somerville High School Student Health Survey results. My name is Lovely Heller Botari, and I am the program director with Somerville Cares About Prevention. Hey everybody, uh, my name is Matt Mitchell, I'm the Prevention Services Manager here in the city of Somerville. Um, we had the pleasure, uh, or I had the pleasure of helping prepare for tonight, um, which is brought to you by the City of Somerville's Health and Human Services Department, uh, Somerville Cares About Prevention, Somerville Positive Forces Youth Leaders, who are all sitting to my left, um, and Somerville Prevention Services. SCAP is a community coalition that works to reduce underage drinking and substance use among youth in Somerville. And Somerville Positive Forces is a leadership program of Somerville Cares About Prevention, which engages young people in designing and implementing prevention projects using prevention best practices. Our SPF leaders worked very hard to help create tonight's event for you in order to highlight student health challenges and victories and to provide an opportunity to discuss ways to build a healthier community. We're all so pleased that you're all able to join us tonight. Um, I'd like to thank uh, a few of our representatives here, uh, City Council, um, Jesse Klingen, who's in attendance, <laughs> as well as a lot of our Health and Human Services Department sitting to our right, um, and many, many others here as well. Um, but I'd like to now turn it over to our guest speaker, um, Christine Coe, who is with Summerstat. She's a Summerstat analyst, um, and she's going to talk a little bit about the importance of data and kind of how we use data here in the city. So thank you so much for having me here today. My name is Christine Coe, and I'm an analyst with the city's Summerstat department. That means my role is to support departments, including health and services, health and human services, and analyzing data and looking at operations and policy to improve how we deliver services for city residents, including all the teens and students who are here today. Um, thanks for being here. Um, so tonight, you guys are all going to be engaging with data as well. You'll, in the student health game, you'll test your assumptions about teen behavior with survey results. And then in the World Cafe portion, you'll be applying the data to identify key issues and potential solutions for our community. Um, before getting started, I wanted to give one concrete example of how data can be used to inform policy. The student health survey asked, how many hours of sleep do you get in a night? Now, some of you who took the survey may be wondering, why does anyone care how much sleep I get? What, how, how can this possibly be useful? Um, well, one reason we care is because research shows that sleep is a critical component of development and lack of sleep can even be associated with physical and mental health problems. Uh, the American Academy of Pedi Pediatrics suggests that teens get 8 to 10 hours of sleep. Now, if I were to ask you, how many teens do you think get 8 to 10 hours of sleep? What would you guess? Um, according to the survey results, <laughs> According to the survey results, about 23% of teens reported getting the right amount of sleep. Now, that means three out of four, the vast majority of students, are not getting the right amount of sleep. There are a lot of factors that cause this, from homework to after school activities, sports, jobs, and having time to hang out with friends and family. Um, we know that teens have busy lives, and local government can't enforce a, a bedtime. But what can we do? <laughs> well, one thing we can do is share data and start a community conversation about health, which is what we're doing tonight. Uh, the data was also, encouraged, was also included in the city's well-being report, which is available on the website, and this is just a little snapshot. By being transparent and sharing data results from surveys and other data sources, we can engage lots of different perspectives, including the perspectives of teens who are directly impacted. Um, and we can use these perspectives to determine the greatest needs for our community and also identify solutions. Another thing we can do to raise awareness about is to raise awareness about the importance of healthy habits. Shape Up Somerville has a campaign called 95210 that gives tips on how to maintain healthy habits. 
You may have seen these posters around your school, city parks, or other buildings. Um, here, we're addressing the same issue, but using data differently. Instead of showing you that most teens aren't getting enough sleep, we're giving you advice on how to get sleep and build healthy habits. The poster provides research-based information and clear action items that you can implement in your daily life. Finally, data can be used to inform policy decisions. Some rural teens, believe it or not, aren't the only ones who aren't getting enough sleep. National data shows that this is a problem with teens across the country. In fact, the Centers for Disease Control have made policy recommendations that schools push back start times to accommodate teen sleep schedules. Um, and some uh, cities, including Seattle, have actually implemented this change and seen positive results. Now, I'm not suggesting that this is the only solution to, uh, to address teen sleep deprivation, and it might not be the right solution for some rural. But these are just some examples of how data has changed uh, school district policy and how cities have, have acted um, to um, provide opportunities for teens. Ultimately, data is only one piece of the puzzle when it comes to addressing public health issues. Data can be useful in determining if there's a problem in the first place and who's being impacted. But we have to look beyond data in order to think of solutions. Um, we need to engage the community to understand existing assets and resources that are being used to address the issue. We need to collaborate with lots of stakeholders um, to brainstorm solutions. And we need to think about the direct and indirect impacts of policy changes. If high school starts later, what happens to after school? What happens to all of the other things that teens are involved with? Um, some of these questions, these are just some questions that are raised by data and certainly aren't exhaustive. Um, I'm going to hand the mic back to Mike, or sorry, hand the mic back to Matt. But before I do, I want to encourage everyone to remember that the data you'll see tonight is about real people, um, some of whom are in the room today. Numbers and statistics have a bad reputation for being cold and impersonal, but these survey results are the reflection of all the teens who took the time to respond to the survey and who had the courage to be honest about their some very personal issues in their lives. Um, so as we play the student health game and have these conversations, let's not forget the human side of data and bring a sense of compassion, empathy, and respect to our discussions. Uh, thank you. And So, we're actually going to turn it over to the SPF youth, so uh, come on up, guys. Thank you, Christine, for that wonderful welcome address. My name is, my name is Alexis, and this is Youth Beat. We are SPF leaders. Before we begin, let's talk about the survey a bit. In 2018, 754 Summerville High School students voluntarily took the student health survey. The survey topics include substance use, violence and safety, mental health, sexual behavior, brain and physical activity, and resilience. So how do we know that the results are valid? The surveys are anonymous and voluntary. Trends show consistency across years. The data is in line with state and national data. Do some students lie? Maybe. However, the survey tool and evaluators take that into account. <coughs> Some questions are asked in different ways to check for consistency. Each survey is reviewed by a data analyst to, um, to check for consistencies and frivolous answers. Students that underreport and students that overreport um, tend to cancel each other out. And inconsistencies are taken out are taken out and are not part of this data set. Now that you have now that you know more about the survey, let's play our student health game. You should all have a set of letters. Raise your hand if you don't, and someone will bring you a set. You will select the answer you think is best and hold up the corresponding letter. 
As you are playing, quietly observe your reactions and data surprises for our group discussion. Following our student health game, there will be an opportunity for you to share your thoughts and ideas about student health issues during our World Cafe style discussions. Staff will share your ideas with organizations that work in each area to help inform their programming and initiatives. Representatives from many of those organizations are here tonight to help facilitate to help facilitate our world style cafe discussion. As we get ready to play, please welcome our SPF 100 leaders, Distributa and Megna. Good evening, my name is Ishavita, and this is Megna, and we are SPF 100 youth leaders. We will be presenting data from the substance use section of the survey. In this section, the survey asks students various questions about drug and alcohol use and related questions. Lifetime use asks if a student has ever used at any time in their life, even just once. 30-day use means a student has used a substance in the last 30 days which may point to more regular use. Research shows that youth use of substances like alcohol and marijuana can have very serious negative impacts on development and life outcomes. Our program has worked very hard over the last 15 years to help prevent youth substance use and related issues. Let's see how we are doing. Okay, let's begin. Get your letters ready. First question. All right, so we're gonna start you guys off easy tonight. What percentage of Somerville High School students surveyed don't smoke cigarettes? Keep in mind this is a 30-day use period. A, 67%, B, 77%, C, 87%, or D, 97%. And I can see that most of you chose C. The answer is D, 97% don't. This is up from 85% in 2008. Almost all students now report they don't smoke. In fact, Data shows the prevalence of cigarette use fell from 15% in 2008 to 3% in 2018. This is a decline of almost 6% in 10 years. Survival youth are making healthier decisions because prevention works. Okay, next question, please. What percentage of Somerville High School students surveyed don't drink alcohol? A, 63%, B, 73%, C, 83%, or D, 93%? And I can see that we're a bit divided this time, so most of you chose B. The answer is C. 83% don't. This is way up from 63% in 2008. Most Somerville High School students don't drink alcohol. This increase is due to the prevention efforts of many organizations, including SPF. SPF works to promote positive social norms, like our Most Don't campaign. This campaign works to correct misconceptions that everyone does it. Because the fact is, most don't. Next question. This one is a little bit tougher. What percentage of Somerville High School students surveyed don't use marijuana? Again, this is a 30-day use period. A, 63%, B, 73%, C, 83%, or D, 93%? This one's a little bit tough. Um, as I can see, most of you chose A. The answer is C, 83% don't. Help us spread the word that most don't. Just pick up one of our most don't buttons on your way out tonight, then wear it and share it. All right, next question. What percentage of Somerville High School students surveyed don't use e-cigarettes? A, 57%, B, 67%, C, 77%, or D, 87%? Okay, most of you chose C this time. The answer is D, 87%. Somerville youth are making healthier decisions once again. Most don't smoke e-cigarettes. Okay, and what percentage of Somerville High School students surveyed don't misuse non-prescribed drugs? A, 90%, B, 93%, C, 96%, or D, 99%? These ones are a little bit tougher. Um, as I can see, we're very divided, but C holds the majority. The answer is D, 99% don't. Some drugs are important and helpful when taken under a doctor's orders, but those same drugs, when taken by someone other than the person to whom they were prescribed, can have terrible health consequences, such as opioid addiction. Opioids are painkillers that are often prescribed after surgeries or for acute pain. 
But while they can be important for controlling pain in the short term, they are extremely addictive. Right, next question, please. What was the most common way that Somerville High School students surveyed gained access to alcohol? A, adults over 21 other than their parent or guardian gave it to them. B, they took it from their parents or guardians without their knowledge. C, they bought it from a liquor store. Or D, parents or guardians bought it for them or gave it to them. Okay, and I can see that most of you chose B. The answer is A, adults over 21 other than a parent or guardian bought or gave it to them. Students that used alcohol reported obtaining it from these adults over 21 other than their parent or guardian. These adults can face up to one year in jail and or a $1,000 fine. Next question. Of Somerville High School students surveyed who have ever used alcohol, at what age have they tried their first drink? A, 9 or 10, B, 11 or 12, C, 13 or 14, or D, 15 or 16? This one's a little bit tough. Um, again, we're pretty divided, so I would say that most of you chose C. The answer is D, 15 or 16. 35.2% of Somerville High School students who have ever tried alcohol for their first drink before they were 15 or 16 years old. People who drink alcohol before the age of 21 are at a much greater risk of harm and addiction. It is never too early to have conversations about alcohol use and the risks of underage drinking. Next question, please. What percentage of Somerville High School students surveyed binge drink? A, 9%, B, 6%, C, 3%, or D, 0%. Numbers are super close on this one. Um, and mostly you chose C. The answer is A, 9%. It's reassuring that so few Somerville High School students binge drink, but this behavior is extremely dangerous. Drinking large amounts of alcohol at a time increases young people's chances of becoming addicted, it harms their brain development, and puts them at greater risk of committing violent acts, getting into accidents, and at a higher risk of getting seriously injured. It is important that young people understand these risks. Next question, please. Um, what percentage of Somerville High School students surveyed believe that people risk harming themselves by regularly using marijuana? A, 45%, B, 55%, C, 65%, or D, 75%. As I can see, most of you chose B this time. The answer is B, 55%. In light of the recent legalization of recreational marijuana in Massachusetts and the increase in the drug's visibility, we need to make sure that we explain to young people the risks that come along with marijuana use including declines in school performance, harm to the developing brain, and greater risk of depression, anxiety, and suicide. The fact that it's legal for adults to use doesn't mean that it's safe. And next question, please. What percentage of Somerville High School students surveyed believe that people risk harming themselves if they use electronic cigarettes? A, 44%, B, 54%, C, 64%, or D, 74%? So you chose B this time. The answer is B, 54%. In light of the recent declaration that teen e-cigarettes has hit epidemic proportions, what do you all think about this statistic and those before it which represent decreased rates around students' perception of harm for these substances? What can we do to help students realize while many of these substances are legal for adults over 21 that they are still harmful? Legal does not automatically equal safe. These are things to consider in our discussions later. This concludes this section. Now we'll turn it over to Kate and Susie for the section on mental health. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Susie and this is Kate and we are both SPF 100 leaders. This section highlights student data around mental health. Let's begin. Okay, first question. What percentage of Somerville High School students surveyed reported worrying about school failure or poor grades? Is the answer A, 44%, B, 54%, C, 64%, or D, 74%? Looks like most of you chose D. 
The correct answer is C, 64%. Yeah. 64% of Somerville High School students worried about school failure or poor grades. This has remained constant over time. Stress and worry such as these are risk factors for unhealthy behaviors like substance use. How can we prevent stress in order to reduce its association to unhealthy behaviors like substance use? Okay, next question. What percentage of Somerville High School students surveyed that they worried about appearance issues? Is the answer A, 15%, B, 25%, C, 35%, or D, 45%? Again, looks like most of you chose D. The correct answer is C, 35%. More than a third of SHS students are worried about their appearance. Society pushes unhealthy beauty standards onto young people, which has real negative consequences on health. Not surprisingly, our data shows that this problem disproportionately affects girls. Okay, next question. What percentage of Somerville High School students surveyed worried about social issues? Is the answer A, 33%, B, 43%, C, 53%, or D, 63%? Looks like most of you are divided between C and D. The correct answer is A, 33%. Experiencing social issues around friendship, dating, teasing, etc. can impact student mental health wellness. Okay, next question. What percentage of Somerville High School students surveyed have a trusted adult in the school that they can talk to? Is the answer A, 58%, B, 68%, C, 78%, or D, 88%? Looks like most of you chose A. I see some Bs out there, too. The correct answer is B, 68%. This is up significantly from 2008 when it was just 52%. Having someone at school to connect with and talk to is very important for student mental health. In what ways can we continue to increase positive connections between students and teachers? Okay, next question. What percentage of Somerville High School students surveyed have experienced anxiety in the last 30 days? On the survey, anxiety was defined as feeling tense, nervous, or worried every day for more than two weeks in a row. Is the answer A, 12%, B, 23%, C, 34%, or D, 42%? Pretty divided across the board. The correct answer is D, 42%. This indicates that many students are struggling to maintain men mental health wellness. What could be the biggest causes of student stress and what are things that could help? Could daily mindfulness and meditation practice at school be a start? Okay, next question. What percentage of Somerville High School students surveyed reported depression in the last 12 months? A, 45%, B, 35%, C, 25%, or D, 15%? See mostly Bs. The correct answer is B, 35%. This is an increase from 31% just two years ago. Over one third of SHS students surveyed report depression. What could be driving these high rates, and what can we do as a community to reduce depression? Okay, next question. What percentage of Somerville High School students surveyed reported seriously considering suicide? Answer, A, 5%, B, 10%, C, 12%, or D, 17%. Pretty divided. Sadly, the answer is D, 17%. This has increased by 5% when 12% was reported in 2016. Young people today face terrible pressures and struggle and need diverse supports more than ever. The wait time to connect with supports is often too long and can add us to a sense of hopelessness. How can our community who come together to increase access to support for youth? All right, Th this is the last question for the mental health section. What percentage of Somerville High School students surveyed reported actually attempting suicide? Is the answer A, 1%, B, 3%, C, 5%, or D, 7%? I see mostly Bs, some Cs. The correct answer is C, 5%. 37 of our peers surveyed had reported actually attempting suicide. 
This and the other data shared in this section indicate that many students are seriously struggling to maintain mental health wellness. For our discussions later, please consider what is driving mental health issues for Somerville teens. How can we meet youth's needs and provide access to positive coping skills and supports? This concludes our section. Next, Hannah and Janelle will be sharing student health data around safety and violence. <coughs> My name is Janelle. And my name is Hannah. This section highlights student data about violence and safety. Let's begin. Question one. What percentage of Somerville High School students surveyed were bullied in or on their way to school? A, 10%, B, 13%, C, 16%, or D, 19%? So we have all different answers across the board. The answer is... B, 13%. This is stayed consistent from 2016. Yet 5% of students surveyed reported staying home out of fear for safety. What can we do to make SHS students feel safer? Next question. What percentage of Somerville High School students surveyed were bullied electronically? A, 4%, B, 8%, C, 10%, or D, 13%? We have mostly D. The answer is D, 13%. Almost as many SHS students were bullied electronically as were bullied on school grounds. Since the rise of social media, what do you think makes people cyberbullied? Next question. What percentage of Somerville High School students surveyed who were bullied told a parent or guardian? A, 34%. B, 44%, C, 54%, or D, 64%? We have mostly A. The answer is A, 34%. Only 34% of students told a parent or guardian. Some teens feel like they can't reach out. Students who are bullied need easy access to supports and people who notice and respond to the signs of bullying. Next question. What percentage of Somerville High School students surveyed who saw someone else get bullied told a teacher, a counselor, or another adult at school? A, 10 per A 14%, B, 24%, C, 34%, or D, 44%? Mostly A. The answer is B, 24%. We must change the harmful idea that seeking adult support is snitching. Teens fear more that their social status seems at risk if you were to tell someone. But telling an adult when you see bullying is an act of bravery and kindness that protects victims and hold bullies accountable. Next question. What percentage of Somerville High School students surveyed had a rude or sexual comment directed toward them? A, 10%, B, 13%, C, 16%, or D, 22%? Mostly Ds. The answer is A, 10%. Can we teach students that it is not acceptable and establish a culture of respect? Please share your ideas during our discussion. Next question. What percentage of Somerville High School students surveyed reported being hurt physically or sexually by a date or by someone they were going out with? A, 3%, B, 6%, C, 9%, or D, 11%? Mostly Bs. The answer is A, 3%. Since students are so young, they don't always know what is normal. What can we do to help educate and protect students? Consider what students need to set and respect boundaries. This concludes our section. Next up is the section on physical health with Trey and you. SPF 100 leaders. This next section highlights student data about physical health and sexual behavior. Let's begin. All right, first question. What percentage of SHS students surveyed reported eating breakfast three or more days in the last seven days? 
A, 19%, B, 29%, C, 39%, or D, 49%. Looks like we have mixed answers. And the answer is... A, 19%. Eating breakfast is so important. Yet over 80% of SHS teens don't get this meal or the benefit it offers. A majority of students are going hungry for hours until lunch, which can greatly impact their ability to learn. Next question, please. What percentage of SHS students surveyed sleep seven hours or less on an average school night? A, 57%, B, 67%, C, 77%, or D, 87%? I'm seeing a mix between C's and D's, and the answer is? C, 77%. Getting at least 8 to 10 hours of sleep is very important for our health and development. Sleep health is just as important as what we eat and how much we eat. Next question, please. What percentage of SHS students surveyed were physically active for a total of at least 60 minutes per day, at least one day in the last week? A, 50%, B, 60%, C, 70%, or D, 80%? I'm seeing a lot of A's. The answer is... D, 80%. 22% of females survey, surveyed overall versus 17% of males, males surveyed overall reported zero days of exercise in the past week. Next question, please. What percentage of SHS students surveyed eat vegetables zero or one time per day? A, 50%. B, 60%. C, 70%. Or D, 80%. Seeing a mix between B's and C's, and the answer is C, seventy percent. Shape Up Somerville recommends eating five at least uh, five at least fruits and veggies a day. Seventy percent of SHS students are eating zero to one. Consider the many obstacles to eating healthy foods and what our community can do to help. Next question, please. What percentage of SHS students surveyed report over three hours a day of screen time for electronic devices? This includes TV, video games, um, computers, phones, etc. Um, A, 35%, B, 45%, C, 55%, or D, 65%. Okay, I see D. <laughs> and the answer is? C, 55%. Shape Up Somerville recommends less than two hours of recreational screen time a day. How can we support less screen time we use for teens? That, that ends our questions for physical health, and these next two questions will cover sexual behavior. Next question, please. What percentage of SHS students surveyed have never had sexual intercourse? A, 50%, B, 60%, C, 70%, or D, 80%? I'm seeing a mix of answers across the board, and the answer is? C, 70% don't. Most SHS teens don't have sexual intercourse. This is the last question in this part of the survey. Of SHS students who reported having sexual intercourse, what percentage surveyed also reported using a condom? A, 37%, B, 47%, C, 57%, or D, 67%? I'm seeing a mix of answers across the board. And the answer is? C, 57%. As young people develop sexually over the course of their adolescence, they need information that will help them make safe choices. The Teen Connection provides supports to students. What else can our community do to help students get the information they need at home and in class? This concludes the, uh, this section. Please welcome Alina and Parveen to prevent the present the next section. My name is Alina, and my name is Pervy, and we're both a part of SPF 100 Leaders. This section highlights student data around gender and race disparities. We believe there are many disparities impacting youth in our community, and we want to begin by highlighting those we found around gender and race. Let's begin. Of those surveyed, how much more likely are girls to very often worry about physical appearance than boys? Is it A, equally likely, B, 1.5 times as likely, C, 2.5 times as likely, or D, 4 times as likely. 
see a lot of D's and C's. The answer is C. Two and a half times as likely. 27% of girls worry very often versus 10% of boys. Next question. Of those surveyed, how much more likely were girls to very often worry about social issues than boys? Is it A, equally likely, B, 1.5 times as likely, C, 2 times as likely, or D, 3 times as likely? Kind of divided, C is an e. The answer is C, 2 times as likely. 20.8% of girls versus 9.1% of boys. Okay, next question. Of those surveyed, how much more likely were girls to have anxiety one or more times than boys? A, equally likely, B, 1.5 times as likely, or C, two times as likely, or D, three times as likely? The answer is C, two times as likely, 56% of girls versus 27% of boys. Okay, next question. Of those surveyed, how much more likely were girls than boys to injure themselves on purpose one or more times? Is it A, equally likely, B, 1.5 times as likely, C, two times as likely, or three times as likely? Mostly C's and D's again. The answer is D, three times as likely, 20% of girls versus 70% of boys. Next question. Of those surveyed, how much more likely are girls to drink alcohol one or more days than boys? And this is within a last 30 day, days. And is it A, equally likely, B, 1 point times as likely, 3, 2 times as likely, or D, 4 times as likely? A lot of A's and B's we see here. The answer is B, 1 and a half times as likely, 20% of girls versus 15% of boys. Next question. Of those surveyed, how much more likely were girls than boys to report riding in a car driven by someone who had been drinking alcohol? Is it A, equally likely, B, two times as likely, or C, three times as likely, or D, four times as likely? A lot of B's and a few A's. The answer is C, three times as likely. This exposes female students to greater risk from drunk driving. What considerations can be, can be made up to help female students? Next question. Which of the following self-identified race surveyed reported the highest percentage of not drinking at least one drink of alcohol? And remember, this is in the last 30 days. Is it A, Asian Pacific Islander students, B, Hispanic or Latino students, C, black students, or D, white students? I see a lot of A's here and a couple of C's. The answer is A, Asian or other specific, specific islanders. Next question. Of those surveyed, how much more likely were girls that have been sexually har harassed in the school <laughs> than boys? Is it A, equally likely, B, three times as likely, or C, eight times as likely, or D, ten times as likely. See a lot of D's and a couple of C's. The answer is C, eight times as likely. 16% of girls versus 2% of boys. Girls were seven times more likely than boys to have been touched, pinched, grabbed, or patted in a sexual way. Next question. At least 85% of which of the following races surveyed reported not smoking marijuana in the last 30 days. Is it A, black students, B, Hispanic students, or C, Asian Pacific Islander students, or D, both B and C? <laughs> see a lot of D's and a few C's. The answer is D, both B and C. Asian or other specific Islander students, 96.9%. Hispanic or Latino students is 84.8%. Next question. This is the last question. At least 50% of which self-identified races surveyed reporting using e-cigarettes in the last 30 days? Is it A, white students, B, Hispanic Latino students, C, black students, or D, A and C? I see a lot of A's and a few B's. 
The answer is D, both A and C. White students at 19% and black students at 15%. Thank you for playing the student health game. Overall, Somerville youth are making better and healthier decisions. That makes all of us a winner. Thank you. So one of the things that I wanted to mention to everybody was a new initiative um, or policy change that we had just passed in December by the Board of Health um, in response to some of the e-cigarette challenges that we've been seeing in the schools. Um, so with that, we effectively restricted the sale of tobacco products, um, including e-cigarettes and flavors, as well as menthol cigarettes, wintergreen and mint flavors, uh, to 21 plus only stores, um, effectively removing them from convenience stores, liquor stores, or anywhere else that are open to um, individuals under the age of 21. So. <laughs> okay, all right, thank you SPF 100 leaders. Let's give them a big round of applause for putting together an excellent presentation for you. Very nice. Now that you guys have a good idea of Somerville Teen Health, we're going to ask you to work in groups to share your experiences, your concerns, and ideas for each health section. You're going to have about five to ten minutes to discuss each health topic. Matt will give the alert when it's time to move to the next section, and we will move clockwise around the room. So community leaders working in these health areas will facilitate our discussions and record your ideas and share back at the end. Let's have each topic facilitator introduce themselves and their agency. Uh, we really appreciate your work in our community tonight, and we thank you all for helping us out. Following this event, SCAP and the Office of Prevention will share these ideas with community organizations, leaders, and working in these health areas to support needed efforts ch to change. Maybe we can have each health section um, go ahead and just introduce yourselves and um, your your health section. So let's start over here. Emma, do you mind standing up and introduce yourself? That would be great. And you'll have to talk loud because you know what? This thing doesn't move unless you want to come up here. Why don't you come up here, Emma? Hi everyone, um, my name is Emma and I am the Sexual and Reproductive Health Counselor at Teen Connection. Um, so again, for those of you who don't know, we have a clinic for um, Somerville High School students and anyone 12 through 24, um, and so that's what we do. Um, and I am here with um, two awesome young people who work with me as a part of Teen Health Advisory, which is an after school program we run. Um, Kenya and Sarah, you guys can do it over there. Um, and they're going to help me lead the discussion about mental health. Can we have the facilitator for the substance abuse prevention section come up and it's Matt, but thank you. It'll be me and it'll also be with Bonnie, who's in the back grabbing some food. Um, so I think we will be right here in these circle tables up front, okay? And I just want to thank, um, who just walked in, um, Senator Jalen uh, for attending. <laughs> We always appreciate it when our representatives and our senators come out to support the youth. So thank you. Yes, welcome. And if we can now have the person who is covering the physical health section, come on up. Our team, come on up and introduce yourselves. That would be great. Hi everyone, my name is Lisa Robinson. I'm Erica Satin Hernandez, and we are the Shape Up Somerville team in Health and Human Services. <laughs> so we're the healthy eating, food access, safe active transit um, area, sort of like your 952 and 0 
um, department, I guess, um, for everybody. Anything else? And we'll be at this table uh, in the back here. So we're excited to talk with you all. And can we have our team of facilitators for the gender disparities, gender and race disparities, come on up and introduce yourselves. That would be great. I'm waiting for Chris, he's taking his time. Okay, I'm Nancy Sullivan, I'm the Manager of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion under the Health and Human Services Department, and I will be doing this with Chris Hosman, the Community Services Manager for the City of Somerville's Health and Human Services Department. And we'll be sitting right over there. Come join us. <laughs> and I believe we have um, two more sections. We have the Violence and Safety section. Please come on up, our facilitators from the Violence and Safety section. Hello, my name is Aaron Jennings. I'm the Health and Human Services Doctoral Resident. And I'll be in this middle table right here in front of the column, right there, all right? Thank you. And I believe we have one more section, uh, sexual health. Sexual health. Oh, I'm talking in the wrong microphone. Okay. All right, the sexual health team of facilitators. Hi, I'm Sarah Spinetchny. I'm the clinical youth specialist for the city of Somerville in the Department of Health and Human Services. Hi, I'm Gay Cody. I'm the director of nursing for the Department of Health and Human Services. We're not sure where we'll be, but just look we'll be somewhere. <laughs> And so that team will be over here. So we're going to do a little bit of shifting around now. Um, so um, I know that folks have all their stuff sort of with them, but you can maybe leave your jackets or things or take them with you because every five to ten minutes we will be moving on to another section to share your ideas. But for now, because we have sort of um, not as many folks at one table and so many folks at another table and maybe tons of youth in the back there, could we sort of spread out and even things out so that we have some young people at each table, some of our awesome high school students, and some of our amazing community leaders spread around to the different sections. So find a section that doesn't have a lot of folks and the youth leaders are going to move out too into their sections. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So settle in in our section. We have mental health over here to the right. And you're, don't worry, you're going to get a chance to visit every section. So even if you're not starting at the section that you want to, that you're most interested in first, you will have a chance to get to that table. Oh, yes. And then you're going to stay with your group. The whole group is going to sort of shift with you. So once you get into your section now, hopefully we'll have a nice mix of folks at each table. I think we need a few more folks over here at sexual health. Come on over to sexual health. Great. Uh, some substance, people in the substance use section too, so, you, yeah, you, can, you can come over here. Um, oh, I gotcha, yeah. So you'll, you'll break it into small groups. And then I see tons of people in the back. If you want to spread out a little bit amongst some of the other tables, John, if you want to maybe I just came back in. Can you repeat? Yes, so we're spreading out into different sections for our discussion session. So if we can have young people at a couple at each section, that would be great. So we have the mental health section, we have the substance use section, we have 
physical health, sexuality, gender, and race disparities, and violence and safety. Did I say that? And, yeah. Okay. Super. All right. Seems like everybody's just about settled in. Yeah, we need a couple more over in sexual health. A couple over in sexual health? That would be awesome. John's going to go over there. He's got that. All right. All right, so everybody's settled into their group. You want to say hello and maybe, the and look at the, just, discussion questions here. So, the things that you're going to discuss at each table are the following. What are the current issues you are facing in this health area? What are the current resource, resources and supports available? And very importantly, what are the gaps or needed resources to support you? What do we need to support in people? And so, and we're going to have note takers at your table, and we have some facilitators, and hopefully everyone's going to have their voice heard, and so you'll have about five minutes or so, and maybe you want to go around and introduce yourselves quickly and say your name and get started. All right. Any questions? No? Okay. Take it away, facilitators. You may begin. So thank you all so very much for coming. Um, this is going to be an informal conversation. Um, I would I'm, love to take notes, and I will give a caveat. My penmanship is horrible, so just, just know that. Um, if you do a quick wrap around, just kind of your name and your, like what board you're in. I'm Ben Johnson, and I'm a parent of one of the We are going to start chair backs for each group. Hi. So we were the mental health group, and we discussed that our top issue was were our top issues were concerning stigma in, in talking about mental health, uh, the access to third party resources and getting help for mental health, and the last one was the generational generational gap when talking to counselors or teachers about these things. Uh, so we had a lot of people say a lot of different things for substance abuse, um, but the number one thing was e-cigarettes and the proliferation of e-cigarettes across the city and in the school, and then all the issues that come with that in the bathrooms and the education piece. Um, the second thing was the methods of education. People talked about um, needing more intimate, um, real, genuine people talking about the issues that are facing and versus assemblies um, or things that are not they're casting a broader, a bigger net, but not hitting people as much as it should. Um, and then the third one was alcohol. People were mentioning how that tends to get pushed down when all these other things get pushed up to the top, um, and kind of how that impacts the youth lives. So. Okay. Thank you. Um, so we had sexual health, and I think the biggest thing that kind of summed it up was just the information that's out there. That whether it's the curriculum or what's being being said is just that it needs to be updated to include things like LGBTQ specific information, um, where to access stuff, and kind of the whole person's sexual health, um, so that it's not just about the physical information that's given, but the practical pieces and the emotional toll too. Okay, so um, we had the table for gender and race disparities. So one of the things that kept coming up was the lack of representation in the environment, in the curriculum, in staff. Additionally, stigma surrounding race and conversations about that and wanting to have more spaces where you can have conversations around race and gender. Um, a resource that kept coming up over and over again was teen empowerment is a really good, useful tool. And wanting more spaces like that. Um, there was the, there are class, there's one class at the high school about race and gender and wanting to have more classes like that and more curriculum that is, um, that is more representational about everyone's history. Um, so those are some of the things that, that came up in our group. Great. So uh, two quick things. One, safety varies based on students' identity, whether they are people of color, they're queer, or, ge or their gender. Um, gender. Um, second one is um, here in the school, um, conditions are related to the construction. Um, who is able to get in the building? IDs are not checked as they should. Um, and lastly, um, it's, it's not operationalized, i.e., it's more of um, um, title than than it actually safety being actually played out because the adults in the building lack authentic relationships with students. 
So we were the physical health group, and the number one thing that we talked about today with all of our groups was about the health education curriculum and how there is an opportunity to update the curriculum as well as uh, teach students how to operationalize it in their daily lives. We know that we should be eating more vegetables and drinking more water instead of soda and all these sorts of things, but how do we actually make those changes? This is the kind of information that students want to see in their health classes. Okay. Well, give yourselves all a round of applause. We really appreciate your coming out to share your ideas, your concerns, your thoughts in all of these health areas. And we want to give the facilitators a big round of applause, too. They did amazing. Now, what is going to happen with all this information? I'm sure you're wondering. And so, you know, we really were strategic about having facilitators that work in these different health areas. And our hope is that they're going to bring this back to their colleagues and start thinking about ways they can address some of these issues. And so your voice really matters here tonight. And we're hoping that you'll also engage, stay engaged in trying to help move some of these change initiatives that are needed forward. So together, I think we can really make a difference on some of these. And so again, I want to thank you for coming out. Take the time to fill out your survey. Everybody should have an event survey now. And um, we really do use these to try and help make the event better. So thank you all. And you have a great evening.